Hello, everyone. We're going to talk about uh, cross-site scripting from a couple of different perspectives. This is really about user interface security. How do you build a good, for the most part, web-enabled user interface to stop the main kind of injection that we see, JavaScript injection, where the attacker can inject their own JavaScript into your site in some way. Who here is a JavaScript programmer at some level, just out of curious curiosity? Most people here, good. All right. So. And before I get too much further into this, there's a couple of rules of play about user interface security I want to talk about. How many secrets should you put into JavaScript in your code? Zero. How much like proprietary code or proprietary business workflow should you put in JavaScript? Zero. How much, uh, um, there's a better way of asking this question. Uh, how, easy it, how easy is it for the attacker to see and analyze all of your JavaScript in your application? It's, it's trivial. View, source. So the trend right now of people doing Backbone and Angular and more rich JavaScript programming is to push business logic deeper into the, into the client, and we need to avoid this. So your user interface should be a view layer. View only. How much access control should we be doing in JavaScript? For the most part, very little. You know, I, I saw an application recently where a large piece of JSON with all this sensitive data was loaded by the client, and then they checked the user's role, which was part of the request, to determine which parts of that JSON can be viewed or not. And this is, this is a trend we want to keep away from this. So but before we even talk about cross-site scripting, you want to program like it's a thin client. Keep your business logic, access control, and any kind of proprietary uh, workflow, keep it out of your client. That's just step one. The next thing we want to do, which is a much more difficult endeavor, we really want to make sure that our applications are, are resistant to the injection of JavaScript. Which it's called cross-site scripting, but that name is wrong. We need a better name for it. My name is Jim Manico. I'll be your... Uh, be your teacher for today, and uh, you know, warning, I'm going to recommend a variety of different open source packages. Be sure you go through a good vetting process in your company before you grab these libraries and just use them. We'll talk about, in this, I'm going to do three different presentations. I'm going to skip a lot of slides. I'm going to talk about basic cross-site scripting first, advanced JavaScript workflow, and then we'll get into things like HTML sanitization and content security policy. So we're going to go through several presentations kind of quickly, but please, if you have any questions, stop me and ask a question. That's always a good thing. So here's a couple examples of, of cross. Let me skip the variants. It's not, I'm not, as, it's not as a big deal. Um, what, do I want to, what do we want to start? One sec. Where am I going to start here? Yep, the different kinds of attack payloads in JavaScript. What can we do with evil JavaScript? How difficult is it to deface an entire website if you control the JavaScript? So I want to do a full virtual site defacement. What would that call look like? Document.body.innerHTML. So if I can inject it into your site, it rewrites the entire page. Or session hijacking, if I want to steal your cookie. I would make a URL and just say document.cookie and submit that to my site, and I've stole your cookie. Network scanning. Go look at the Beef Project. It's a browser exploitation framework. There's a whole like network scanner built in. One of the demos uh, I did recently was I had a pineapple where anyone could anonymously connect to this pineapple for free wireless, and anybody make an HTTP connection would just inject JavaScript, take over the browser, and scan the entire network from their perspective. So we also have um, site redirection. That's just window.location. Or data theft. Again, I can just make a GET request and add whatever data I want to, to steal to it. So these attacks are, are, I think, fairly well known. They're fairly simple for the attacker, and the damage they do is rather dramatic. We've seen a very rise in cross-site scripting attacks across major websites. This is a very difficult issue to get your hands around. There's three variants of cross-site scripting. Reflective, that's when the attack is on the URL. Stored, that's when the attack is stored in your database. And DOM, that's loosely when the attack launches deep within JavaScript APIs. And so a reflected XSS is just when the request parameter 
is directly rendered in the user interface. Here's a little bit of active server page code, some C-sharp. It's just a basic page loading. They're grabbing this request parameter from the URL and directly putting it in the user interface. This is the, the main example of what cross-site scripting is, right? This is stored cross-site scripting code. I'm grabbing some ID from the request, I'm executing that statement, and I'm grabbing data from the database and just putting it directly in the user interface with no security. That's stored XSS. When we look at how we're rendering variables, this, this variable comment came from the database. Should we think of it as trusted data? No way. So one, someone said only data from the user is untrusted. And my vote is any string that you're messing with in your code, treat it like it's untrusted. It's a better, it's a better thought process. I see a lot of research doing things like taint tracking. I see a lot of research to trying to determine which variables are dangerous and which are not. I think this is a bad route of research. Every function, every user interface, every controller code we build should, have, should be resistant to any attack from any strings when it comes to injection specifically. DOM XSS, we'll talk about that in our next section. And so, uh, so hopefully we have a, a decent idea of what cross-site scripting is already. This is supposed to be an advanced section. I'm going to skip a lot of the, the demos. So we know that the attacker, through submitting to your form or adding some JavaScript to a URL and then emailing that URL to someone else, they can cause your users to execute attacker-driven JavaScript. How do we stop this? Anybody have an idea as to what we need to do in our code to really stop cross-site scripting? This is going to be, to some degree, this is a good first step, but you can have completely valid data that's still dangerous. So input validation is, is really not the, I mean, with respect, Maris, input validation is not the, the answer. It's, it's something we should still do, but we want to focus on output encoding. This, it's, it's not like we're trying to limit what data can enter our system. That's good, but when we're in the user interface, we don't care where it came from or what validation happened. We're always going to protect it. I'll show you that in just a second. So, the, the, so here's some solutions. How about let's just eliminate the less than, greater than, ampersand, double quote, and single quote character. Let's just eliminate all those characters and strip them out at, at, the, at a filter. How's that going to work? Why not? In certain contexts, you're definitely right. Suppose that if I'm just putting data in the middle of an HTML body, just like between two P tags, without these characters, no attack can get through in, in certain contexts. So go even further. Suppose if I remove these characters, it actually would fix the problem. But why is it still a bad idea? Maybe Sometimes users would be able to input those characters. Like think of Ireland. You got the O'Shea's. You got the O'Malley's. You got the O'Manics. You know, they're all... They need their single quote. One of, the, one of the times where I got the most errors, or the, the most support calls from one of my websites I was working on was when we stripped out the single quote for security. We got 10,000 requests coming in the next week from Ireland saying, I can't put my name in. What's wrong with you? So don't mess with the Irish. How about let's eliminate all special characters? Same problem. Let's just disallow all user input. We'll need a new job. So. These, and a global filter won't work either because we need to understand the context. Well, let's get into it. Here's the real solution here. We, for, for phase one, we want to do output encoding. And to your point, we definitely want to do input validation. It's still a good defense, but it's the output encoding that's going to save us. And we'll, let's get into that. And in every major language, there's an output encoding library built in. Ruby on Rails has been built in for a while. In the PHP, there's the Zend framework has a great escaper. For Java, I'm going to show you right now the OWASP Java encoder project, an OWASP project that does very high performance escaping. In .NET, they have a built-in escaping function, the anti-XSS library. In Go, Go is super awesome. Learn Go. It is on the rise. Like 10% of all check-ins at OHLOH is coming from Go programming. So this is one of the best thought-out languages from a security perspective, in my opinion. And one of those, one of those artifacts that are so good in Go is the Go, Golang template mechanism. 
This is, so this template, you just throw any data at it and it will do the proper escaping and security for you automatically. That's what we need for a better future when it comes to this topic. And there's even escapers encoding libraries for legacy languages that we, you know, old stuff we don't really care about like Python and Perl. Oh, I'm just kidding. Just kidding you Python people. What does the browser think you're doing when it gets this character? The browser thinks this is code. It thinks you're starting a new HTML tag. We have to escape it and convert it to a form that's non-executing. Ampersand LT semicolon is an HTML entity that will display the less than symbol, but not execute it like code. And so, you know, there's all these functions that we have to do output encoding, but don't do it yourself. Just use one of the libraries. They're, they've become pretty standardized and, and well-written these days. So this is back to your point as well. We want to validate and encode all input. So we have an email address coming in. I can have all kinds of dangerous characters legally in an email address. I do my regular expression to make sure it fits and then uh, to, to make sure it's a legal email address. And I'm still not going to trust it. Before I put that email address in the user interface, I'm going to escape it. This doesn't change the data. It still looks like what the user submitted. We're just taking all dangerous characters and converting them to a form that will not execute in the browser. So that's it. And so the problem is we need to escape differently based on where we put that data in the browser. Everybody with me so far? Is this a, did I, have I lost anyone yet? Is everybody with me? So far, so good? So when we're putting data in the browser, when we're putting data into HTML, we have to do a different kind of escaping based on where it lands. Let me show you some examples of this because even though most developers are good at doing escaping now overall, I think, sometimes these different contexts get a little bit complicated. So um, let's, let's look at them. So here's the project I'm going to talk about, the OWASH Java Encoder project. We have some recent updates as well beyond this slide. So we, we keep it up to date, just a few of us who work on it. And as we're putting, here's an example of a Java server page, right? As we're putting data in different slots within the user interface, we're going to use the proper escaping function, encode for HTML, encode for HTML attribute, etc. Let's look at these carefully, though. So before we go too much further, the OWASP Java encoder project, it has a whole, a, quite a few number of granular functions that let you escape beyond most other libraries. We have the same kind of granularity in the anti-XSS library as well. And so the first thing that comes up is snippets of code like this. Again, the best place to defeat cross-site scripting, the best place to defeat JavaScript injection is in the user interface itself. So here I have this untrusted variable, or just any variable, frankly, and before I put it between two bold tags or two p tags, I'm going to say encode for HTML because I'm in the body of an HTML document. And down here, I'm going to put this data between two text areas. That's a different escaping context. If you want to get really, most people don't differentiate this. Every other library besides the OWASP encoder project, they just use encode for HTML in this context. But if you do encode for HTML between a text area, you're encoding way too much. And so a lot of the original escaping functions that were written for different languages, their philosophy was, let's escape every character that is even remotely dangerous. So now we're really safe. What's wrong with that? If you're going to take data from the user and escape way beyond what you need to, what's the problem? What's that? I'm not going to lose data, but um, you're not going to lose functionality. It's good. Everything's going to work and nothing's going to break. Performance. What's that? Performance. performance. And not just performance of the encoder itself, the size of your page. And if you're really fighting for performance on mobile networks, you really need your page size to be as concise as possible. And now you start supporting internationalization, most of these encoders will encode every single character. This becomes a non-starter if you're really trying to... Uh, um, it, this becomes a bad idea if you're really trying to do good security with performance. I see a lot of AppSec guys separate these out. They talk about really good encoding and escaping. And they think that's okay by itself, and that's not a good idea. Performance, functionality, and security all must be considered together, in, in my opinion. So, so here we have a granular API 
that will escape very few characters because when you're in a text area, you don't need to escape many characters. And the, the individual who did this research was Jeff Ikonowski. He's like a PhD compiler theory robotics student. And I'm like, <coughs> Jeff, no other encoder does this. Why are you doing it? How did you figure this out? He said, because Jim, I went into the Gecko engine and looked at their source code. I went into the, you know, all the different engines, that are, the, into WebKit, and looked at what they were doing to make these encoding choices. No one else has done that research before Jeff, in my opinion, so just food for thought here. And in anti-XSS, they don't differentiate, just encode for HTML. Again, .NET is the most performance uh, negative platform out there. I can build .NET stuff quick, but try getting it to scale, good luck with that. And this is one of the problems, it encodes way too much because of the lack of maturity of their escaping functions. So here's another example of escaping. Here I'm putting data in a, in a, tech, in a, a attribute. We have an input type is text, the name is data, and the value is quote for HTML attribute, untrusted. So because this is in a quoted value, I can say for HTML attribute. That's the same thing .NET does. But in the, in the Java encoder, we have extra granularity. We have encode for HTML unquoted attribute in case you have some legacy remediation. When you're in a quoted attribute, you need to encode very few characters. And yet most encoding libraries, they encode every possible character. This is nonsense. It hurts performance and page load time. So we have this very granular API in the Java encoder for HTML attribute that encodes very little and encode for HTML unquoted attribute which encodes a whole bunch more. So, and in anti-XSS, we have encode for HTML attribute encode. They don't differentiate within, within .NET, but it still works, it's just not, it's not performance friendly, right? So here's a, a little bit more complex of a topic, dealing with URLs and URL fragments. Look at this little chunk of code here. In this code, I have, I'm building a link for the user. I'm in the user interface, it's a search link, and the value of this is from the user. They just typed in some search term, and I want to show them that search term back in a way they can link on it. So I say, you know, encode for URI component of that parameter. You never do URL encoding on a complete URL, you'll break it. So I'm using the proper term URI component. When you're putting a fragment of a URL that's driven by a user, or you just don't trust it into a, an href link like this, we want to do URI encoding in both these contexts for building a REST API as well. And in .NET, they name it wrong. It's still okay, I'm not trying to attack .NET, but they, name it, they named it wrong and it's slow. You know, it's encoding way too much as usual. But it's super safe, but not performance friendly. And one without the other is a bad idea. So let's talk, so that's, this is how you handle fragments of a URL. Not a complete URL, just a fragment of a URL. So what we have here is a strategy to, to dealing with an entire URL. Think of Twitter. Anybody here use social networks where you type in some text? You type in a URL, and when that tweet is shown to another user, it becomes a link. Now that, that pattern that Twitter had to support, taking a 140 character tweet and turning part of it into a link actually caused them to have hundreds of thousands of users tweeting about how much they loved goats in an illegal way, actually. They love goats too much. This is called the, the Twitter goat love worm that spread through their infrastructure because of how poorly they were handling URLs here. So when you want to handle an untrusted URL, the user is submitting a link to some news article that you want to show to other users, you first want to validate to make sure it's a real URL. And that's not easy. We'll look at that in just a second. You want to avoid JavaScript URLs. Do you realize you can type in Java, you know how you have HTTP as a URL? You can type in JavaScript as a URL type. That's legal, right? Anyone ever seen this before? Look at our good friends at Chrome here. I know my connection's not private. It's not logged in. FC guest. What's the password? It is 201591. Thank you. Let's just hit some site, right? Uh, yeah, sorry about the news. Let's go to doc. So here we go. JavaScript um, document dot body dot inner HTML equals. Let's make happy news. You know, don't worry. 
Be happy. Be. That's a legal URL I just typed in. So we have when we're accepting URLs from the user, this is a legal scheme within a URL. We have to we can't we got to reject these or they will automatically execute JavaScript. WordPress before 303, 3.0.3 was highly vulnerable to this exact problem of accepting JavaScript URLs. And, so, and then, when you put the URL in a proper link, you have to encode it differently for each context. Let's look at it. I know this is not exciting, this is a little bit boring, but it's very important when building a robust UI. So here I have a, a string. I want to check if it's a URL or not. In Java, I run it through the URI class, first of all. Then I'm going to make sure that it's only accepting HTTP, or HTTPS schemes. Everything else gets rejected. And if there's any get user info data, I tend to reject it. I don't trust that. That's when you have like a username and password between the scheme and the URL. So I'll just say, eh, usually that's nothing good. I'm going to reject it. Then I'm going to normalize the URL, get rid of dot dot slashes. And what, what returns out is a legal URL, a legal URI. But is it safe? No way. And a lot of people do validation and they think it makes things safe, and it does not. I can legally put tags and markup in a URL that will pass the sanitizer and the validator, be a legal URL, but still cause cross-site scripting. So we have to do, so we have to escape it when we put it in the user interface. And this, look at this carefully. I have an href link, um, and, and what is an href? An href is just an attribute. So I'm saying encode for HTML attribute. And then between two tags, I'm just saying encode for HTML content. This is why you can't solve this problem on input, because one input coming in may need a different encoding if it's displayed in different contexts in the user interface, right? So far, so good, everyone? And so we also have all these places where we're putting data directly in a JavaScript space. So I have an on-click handler an alert, it's properly quoted, good, now I'm safe, so I can take this message and put it in the quoted context, but you know, we don't know if it's dangerous, we assume it's gonna be dangerous, and just escape it, encode for JavaScript. Here I'm in an event handler, again, now if you want to, you can say encode for JavaScript attribute. It's a more granular encoder specific for event handlers. Now, we don't want to do this in general, but it's at least available. Again, the goal here is to encode as minimally as possible and still be safe. And I don't think anyone does that except for this library. Big fan of Jeff's work here. And so down here, we have a, a JavaScript block. Because we're in a script block, it actually requires different kind of encoding, or a better way of putting it. We can put data in a script block with the variable assignment and encode very little and still be completely safe. So we have encode for JavaScript block. .NET does not differentiate among these different contexts. They just say encode for JavaScript encode. Still secure, but a little performance unfriendly. And now we're gonna put data in the middle of style. First of all, can you think of a good reason to put input from the user into a style? I don't think there is. I think, first of all, you should avoid, completely avoid this pattern. That's the better way to roll. But if you have legacy code, here's how you make it at least somewhat safe. We have the background URL. The user gives us some URL to some image on their site, and we want to take it for some reason, so we say encode for CSS URL. Or if we have a string for a background color, it must be quoted, and we say encode for CSS string. And .NET doesn't differentiate amongst these different contexts. They just say encoder for CSS encode. Cool. Now, there's some places we just can't safely put data into the DOM. Like, I can't put data in, in the middle of a tag. I can't put data in the middle of a eval function. That just executes by design. So really want to stick to just the safe context within your, within your encoding library. Some of the reasons we see XSS even in modern frameworks is because developers will, will turn off escaping or put data in completely unsafe context that we just can't protect in some way. So that, that's phase one. I went through that fast because it's supposed to be advanced. Let's, let's go to the more, more nitty gritty stuff here. <coughs> so that's step one. If you're using an older framework, basic HTML rendering 
in a like a Java server page or a PHP file, old school templates, you want to do proper encoding on every single variable that you put into the DOM. So I want to, I want to, uh, an academic term I, a term I made up, I call it perfect injection resistance. What this means is when you build your user interface and you add protections in your user interface, it shouldn't matter what's happening upstream. Your user interface should be completely, absolutely self-protecting. One of the biggest problems we see is when developers turn off escaping. So anytime escaping is turned off, we should swap out HTML sanitization instead. So we should never take a string and put it free within the user interface. Oh, every variable needs some kind of protection. And so let's, so we already talked about escaping. That's, that's step one. But now we have this issue where very often we can't escape some kind of content. We can't escape HTML actually. And we deal with HTML everywhere. Tiny MCE or CK editor widgets, web forums that let you put HTML in, or the app store is JavaScript based to some degree. Outlook will let you put in HTML tags into your email or advertisements that we have to put on our websites. All of this is example of us having to accept HTML from a user or another entity. How do you make HTML safe? If you get a chunk of HTML from the user, how do you ensure its safety so you can send it to another user? Not, um, if you output and code HTML, what do you get? I mean, I'm saying if you have, if, if someone, let me explain it this way. Here we have a widget called TinyMCE. TinyMCE is a WYSIWYG editor in JavaScript. When you apply, this is a very common library. Anybody use this before? TinyMCE or CK editor? Right. So this is a, a JavaScript library that you apply to your form and it converts a text area into a, a document editor. You can make things bold. You can add images. You can do bullet point list and change the font size and color. When you hit submit on TinyMCE, what does it submit? A chunk of HTML like we see here. So if I take this chunk of HTML and encode it, what's it gonna look like on the page? Like the source. It will look like the source. So we can't encode it, otherwise it won't render. It will just show up. Because again, when we encode, we take the, the less than symbol and we convert it to an HTML entity. And so it just displays the less than symbol, but it doesn't execute it as part of a tag. So we can't encode HTML. We have to sanitize it. And so um, here's an example of a bunch of different libraries trying to do HTML sanitization. And let me just, let me just show this real quick. So let me go open up a text area real quick. Let's open, let's, let's, uh, let's, see if I can, let's make a new quick HTML doc. Let's make a quick body tag. Let's end the body tag and end the HTML document. And I'll say, hello, Jim. Now this Jim is the variable. It's gonna be username, hello, username. Very common piece of code. And so as an attack, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna say, hey, my username is now script alert one, right? And so let's go take a look at this. Let's go, how do I do this? Format. Let's go to plain text. Forgive me if this is review. Let's go for it anyways. Let's save this to the desktop and call it test HTML. I think that'll work. Use HTML for me, please. So now we're gonna go to this little test file and run it. And it actually executes the JavaScript because it's being put there raw. So in order to make this, and, and again, if you're accepting markup from the user, that, that's what you need to put it in, this, in there raw. When I do encoding, I'm actually gonna convert this character to LT semicolon. I'm gonna convert this to ampersand GT semicolon, and, or sorry, LT semicolon. And please note, I'm only encoding one character here, just the less than symbol. Um, and I can go, I'll go back to the browser, refresh it. It didn't execute. It actually showed the markup here without actually executing. That's the hallmark of HTML escaping. So if I have like a little chunk of HTML here where it's like H1, 
or I, I'm accepting HTML from Tiny MCE now, and I get an uh, unordered list, and I get a list item. Hello, another list item. You know, hello to, and then end the unordered list. This is an example of us taking markup from Tiny MCE, and you can't see that at all. Oh, great. Let's go. Um, you can't. Can you see this at all? A little good enough. So. Here we have the markup that we're taking from Tiny MCE, and let's look at that. It actually builds the bullet list. We need it to. If I encode this, let's try it. Ampersand LT semicolon. Now look at how little I'm encoding. I'm just encoding one character. All these other libraries are way overkill for no reason. And I'll just encode this manually. And if we did this, we would get this. We would get. I didn't do it right. So it, well. T semicolon, close enough, we get the idea. So I did the encoding, but it's not working. It's just showing the markup on the screen. We want it to render this markup safely to other users. That's why we can't, that's why we can't encode raw HTML. So we have to use some kind of sanitizer. And let's look at a few libraries that have tried to do this in the past. Here's Node.js back a few years ago. They strip out redirect 302s recursively. Let's, let's, let's look at this. This is, a, this is fun. This is fun for the whole family. What do, we, what do we do in the weekends? We just go through sanitizing code and, uh, okay, let's make it rich text. Let's actually make that font the size we can all read. Yeah, so here's input into older versions of Node.js, very popular framework. They recursively strip out redirect 302s in an effort to sanitize HTML. So we, we one, redirect 302, two, redirect 302, three, redirect 302, four. Whoa, what just happened? Node trying to do validation on the HTML took safe HTML, even though it was broken, it was still safe, and just by cleaning it up, they made it unsafe. So this is a difficult problem to get right. That's Node. We have the same problem, a similar problem in, in SharePoint. Okay, this is not a small system. This is a very popular system in the Microsoft world. It allowed an expression, which will execute in older versions of IE. Here we have Code Igniter. It took this input, which was malformed HTML, and by trying to clean it up, they made it executable down here. Even though it's encoded, it's HTML entity encoded, which is legal in an attribute. How about WordPress 303 and before? We have, jo they accepted JavaScript URLs. This is not even that long ago, which, is, which, which will execute when the page is rendered in all browsers. So the, the point is, is that high level parsing of HTML is incredibly difficult. We need a formal library to do this for us. In the Java world, I tend to use the OWASP HTML sanitizer project. It, it, it allows you to take arbitrary HTML, set a policy for it, and return a safe subset. So here we have a basic policy factory. We're allowing P tags. We're allowing a certain list of class tags, the div tag, different H tags, anything. And then we need to say policy sanitize, of whatever string you have. What gets spit out will abide by your policy and is now safe to render in other users' browser. Here's an example where, again, encoding's not gonna help us. We do need input validation. We need, but formal HTML sanitization. And you gotta use a proper library for this. In pure JavaScript, we have like the Google Kaha project, and it has a built-in sanitizer. In Python, there's the HTML bleach project. In PHP, there's the HTMLaud project. In .NET, there's a good fork of the HTML sanitizer. Ruby on Rails has a built-in HTML sanitizer from 4.0 and above, and in Java, the OWASP Java HTML sanitizer project. It was actually written by Michael Samuel, one of the lead AppSec engineers for Google, who donated that to OWASP. So here's the question. Where should we do HTML sanitization? On input or on display? I say both. For when you first get the data, go for HTML sanitization and clean it up or reject, whatever you want to do. But when you're in the user interface, I say never depend on any protection upstream. You have no control of that. Think about that, and that will give you future security. So you escape which variable? Every single variable. 
and you sanitize any variable that you, doesn't, cannot be escaped that has HTML in it. Now you're building clients that are secure, not just for today, but for the future. When people change things up front, when someone injects into your database through SQL injection, you're still going to be safe because you're applying all the right controls on every variable in your user interface. So far, so good, everybody? So, so okay, let me just charge on. So the next thing is DOM-based XSS. This is when data is flowing throughout the DOM with JavaScript calls using JavaScript libraries. When you want to populate the DOM, you have to use some function in JavaScript to populate that DOM. And unfortunately, most every single API in JavaScript is dangerous in some way. Dot eval is just evil. It will decode and execute any string. Exact script, function, set intervals, set timeout, and request animation frame, these are all direct execution. Whatever string gets into them will just directly execute. So if you take user data or any string that's tainted and put it into these functions, it will execute. Script source, iframe source, all of these will render raw HTML, unless you put a script tag or more in. And so, uh, these are just uh, event handlers. So all of these are dangerous places to put variables into. They lead to cross-site scripting. Now here's some examples of some safe syncs. When you're populating the DOM in JavaScript, there are very few APIs that you need to use. And so, in fact, you could apply these, these variable assignments to almost every single object. So inner text is like how to populate um, like a div safely. Text contents a bit, is, is a bit more functional. Dot value will let you populate like a form field value or similar. And document create text node will safely let you dynamically add widgets to the DOM without any script injection. And when you're parsing JSON in the browser, don't use eval, use json.parse. So honestly, I've seen some multi-million line JavaScript applications that only populated the DOM with these APIs. That's all you need. You can apply them to almost anything to safely inject text into that, uh, into that API. What about jQuery? It's a pretty popular framework or library. Is jQuery safe? What do you think? Is jQuery safe? By default, just use it and you're good to go? Absolutely not. Look at this. So if I get untrusted data or a string that an attacker can modify into .html, .before, .after, .append, .prepend, or the raw jQuery call, these all lead to script execution. Right? Pretty much all of these jQuery APIs are dangerous. We're back to the same world. When you want to safely populate the DOM with jQuery, there's only a couple safe examples, .text and .val. And honestly, that's all you really need to dynamically populate pretty much any area within jQuery. So it's actually not a lot of extra things you have to do. It's a lot less. Just use the safe stuff. It's not going to harm your ability to still provide rich functionality. So the next thing is, did you trust all JSON? Absolutely not. We see JSON that might be uh, modifiable by the attacker in some way that has actual function calls or actual script blocks in it. And if, if this gets evaled, or if these individual elements get uh, manipulated in some way or rendered, it will cause script execution. So, you know, one thing I recommend is an, as a JSON sanitizer, this is more of a beta project, but it lets you put a sanitizer call in either end of the JSON pipeline. When I'm sending JSON from the browser to the server, I'll run it through the sanitizer before I accept it. When I'm building JSON and I want to send it down to the browser, I'll sanitize it to make sure it's well formed. And it's really, it just, you just call json.parse. Really simple to call it. The other key thing is, and just as a secondary note, when you're accepting JSON from the browser, how much can you trust that JSON? What's that? The browser. How, can the attacker modify the JSON that's leaving the browser? Absolutely. We cannot trust any of it. But what most uh, REST programmers and JSON programmers do, they, they just immediately dump JSON into their object model and start ripping it apart. 
In the world of XML, we really recommend not to do that. We have an XML schema to define what the structure of our XML should be, and we can reject everything else. So there's a couple emerging JSON schema APIs that are really well thought out and very doable. I highly recommend on the server, before you start parsing your JSON, run it through a schema, which defines the structure of your JSON. And if that structure is not met, then reject. This is, no one does it, or very few do it, but it's a very good idea to, to add more robust code. Why are, you, why are you smirking? Oh, just use XML. What's that? Oh, just use XML. Nah, you can. If you, you can use XML and all that, but XML is dead. <laughs> yeah. This stinks. Well, which is now getting the same level of complexity to solve the same problems. Um, yeah, well, X XML requires third-party libraries to parse within the browser. It's slow parsing. The, the world is leaving XML because it's, yeah. especially for, especially for browser-based applications because of, of the per performance and, and uh, the conciseness of the JSON pattern. I still use XML. Most web services I see, they still support JSON and XML. I agree. Just if you're good, and do schema validation on both of them. So, but XML's dead. I'm just, just kidding, just kidding. A couple other things we can do is we can sandbox different JavaScript. I don't use it that much, but you can do like object.seal on a JavaScript object for ECMAScript 5 or, and check if an object sealed. This will stop other code from deleting, changing the descriptors of, or any of the object properties can no longer be modified, but you can still you know, operate on that object. I don't use it that much, but it's interesting that these are available. This is much more, something I use much more often. This is iframe sandboxing. I can build an iframe. I can make the sandbox to be an empty string and then take some content from a third party, like an advertisement or just some code I may not trust in some way and drop it in the iframe. That becomes an isolated little chunk, right? And so I had, a, I had a person go to me, hey, Jim, I, I followed your advice, and we used an iframe, but we still got attacked through it. And I'm like, well, let me see your code. I looked at their code, and they were doing this. They did this. They said, iframe, source equals some source, sandbox equals uh, that, and then they, let me go check my iframe code here. Bum, bum, bum. Yep, that's right. And this was a variable. So here was the attack. The problem was the source was able to be tainted by the attacker in some way. <coughs> so the attack here would be like double quote, end the iframe, open up a script, prove I can get the attack in, and then open up a new iframe for completeness and then do source equals that. So there's my attack. Put this right in there, bang. Iframe source is empty and the iframe. There's my script attack launching and I cleaned up to make sure the iframe is still well formed. So all I'm, I'm, all I'm trying to say is you still need to escape properly when you're dropping data into the DOM in some way, but if you have it more hard coded or, or safe in some way, if you sandbox, whatever content shows up here, it can't submit forms, it can't load scripts, it can only do very basic things like show the advertisement. The, the web and advertisers are at war, make no mistake. I mean, all these security standards emerging like content security policy are gonna make advertisers very, very upset, unfortunately. So I, and I don't have a good answer to that, but uh, if, if, if you care about security, don't put advertisements in your site. Just don't do it. Look at the research from Jeremiah Gross, one of my old bosses. He did a, a black hat talk called The Million Man Botnet. And what he did was he uh, uh, maliciously went and like, did a bunch of advertisement campaigns through, com through very big advertisers. And he put, some, he, he put like a link to his JavaScript and it was safe. They let it go through. And after a few days, he just swapped it out with an attack something that didn't hurt anybody, and suddenly he's got like a million different browsers running his JavaScript. So these advertising networks are 
horrible from a security point of view. So the websites you're building, if they are enterprise, if they are government, if they are you know, real secure applications, never put advertising in any of them. The moment you start dropping advertisements in, you're undermining the most basic foundations of good security. But like, you know, if you have a website like, you know, stropewaffles.com, a bunch of strope waffle reviews, put your advertisements on that all day. Who cares? That's not meant to be secure per se. All right. A few other notes. There's a good response header that you can add that you can add to uh, pardon me for one sec. There's a good response header that you should be adding to every page at this point. This is a really good header, which has become much more robust in the last couple of years. It's, the, it, it's to enable the browser's built-in cross-site scripting auditor and defensive code. This, is, this code in the browser, especially IE and Chrome, they'll detect when they see JavaScript in the URL and, and not render it in some way. And so we have the, the header is X, XSS protection, um, one, mode is block. I recommend just going, going in block mode, you're good to go. IE is the main browser that supports this, and we know that IE is the number one browser for downloading a better browser. Okay. Anybody here still supporting IE6 by any chance? Did someone raise their hand? IE6? Are you, yo, are you really supporting IE6 still? Well, it's, I mean, it's flat HTML. It's not, it's not a, a, a rich site per se. I, I'm, I'm gonna stop on, on that. So here's, here's the last slide for section two here. I'm gonna, let, let's put a lot of these ideas, at least in the JavaScript world together, and let's talk about how can we build an ultra high performance page that's still perfectly safe. There's a couple different things we need to do to do this correctly. The way that most pages deal with JSON, the mo modern applications, they do it in two phases. You make a request, you're in the browser, you make a request to the server, and you get back some static HTML, then they then make another JSON hit to the server, and return JSON, and populate the DOM. Does that sound familiar, everybody? What's the problem with that, though? Especially on mobile networks. How many requests did it take me to populate that page? One for the HTML, and a second one for the, for the JSON. And if you're on a mobile network, that latency is gonna hurt you bad. If you look actually at Gmail for mobile, the, not Gmail thick client for mobile, but Gmail the actual web page for mobile, they put all of their CSS, JavaScript, and HTML all in one page. Why? because of mobile network latency. And so here we have a scheme from the Twitter engineers and other people that separates JSON and HTML, has the browser do that rendering for scalability, but still does it very safely from a cross-site scripting point of view without doing, uh, with, with only doing a little bit of encoding. Let's look at this. First, we deliver the main HTML page with the JSON built into it. So as we're building our HTML page, we have all the static HTML at the bottom, and the JSON is just embedded on the page directly. Now, as we embed that JSON on the page, we can't trust it, so we're going to say encode for, HT encode for HTML, so we're safely dropping our JSON in the DOM in a safe container. And this is script of type application JSON encoded within this variable init data. So now I've safely put the JSON on the page without requiring a second, pay, a second JSON hit for my initial page load. Then I say data element, document dot get element by ID the init data. I grab the JSON, get it to text content, and then parse it in the init data, and then populate the DOM with all of our safe APIs, inner text, text content, dot value, or dot text and dot val in jQuery. This is how modern, high, high performance web scale applications handle great scale, build the document in the browser, let the user CPU do the work of ripping apart the JSON and populating the page, but still doing it in a highly performant way. Food for thought. We'll talk about content security policy as our third, our third group of, of uh, 
third group of user interface defense. Let's look at some content security policy. Before we move on, any questions so far? Please. Um, so one of the things we see a lot is frameworks like GWT, uh, mm -hmm. some of those Angular. that implement a whole new protocol. Mm -hmm. So you basically have to trust the framework. Let's switch the let's switch the conversation a bit. You're worried about how frameworks deal with the user interface. We're talking about cross-site scripting, primarily a user interface security issue. So the question you want to ask is, how do these new frameworks like Angular and Backbone and whatever, how do they deal with cross or GWT? How do they deal with uh, protecting the user interface from cross-site scripting? Is that a is that a, can, I, can I switch the question a bit? Well, see, their protocols don't matter as much. What matters is how they populate the user interface. That's the more important part. Their own custom protocols, that leads to other problems outside of the scope of this topic. But specific to, you, specific to how do, does these frameworks safely build a user interface, I can address that question in the context of this, of this topic. So look at Angular. Angular will automatically escape any variable that you put into a user interface. This is great. And so overall, Angular, if you just use it like you're supposed to, you're going to be very safe. So this programmer recently, they, they had their input with line breaks in it. And they wanted to convert every line break to a break tag so it will accept those line breaks in a web document. Sound familiar? Sound reasonable? So they found this widget that would convert line breaks to, to break tags, nice and simple. And they used this widget, and it told them that they had to disable Angular escaping for this variable to make it work, because it was now HTML. So this programmer turned off escaping in Angular. They said, make unsafe. And they put this variable directly in, and suddenly a safe application became cross-site scriptable because of this simple widget they want to use. So a good framework, when you turn off escaping, should enable HTML sanitization by default. None of them do it, but they should. And so Angular, Backbone, GWT, by default, use their basic widgets, use their basic rendering template methodology, and they're very safe. It's, but developers want to do crazy things. We all do. And they start turning off escaping or building their own components and they don't do proper defense, and then things get, then these relatively safe frameworks become accessible. That's what happens. Did I answer your question to some degree, or? I'm just curious what you see, because to go and audit the frameworks is a big job you don't necessarily want to do. The, 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 the whole idea about frameworks and custom protocols, was, this is it's out of the scope of XSS. Luckily for us, it's just, how can we make our user interfaces super robust? When you want to like, uh, when you want to deal with the custom protocol of these frameworks, it's just a lot of work, and so there's no way around it. You have to understand the protocol, use an interceptor, look at it, start messing with it, and it's very difficult and time-consuming. They all do it very differently. That's why AppSec is getting harder to analyze some of these more advanced applications because of these exact problems. Let's switch to content security policy next, and so. So content security policy is probably the most important security control that reduces the attack surface of your web application. And this is, this is a dramatically positive uh, standard. Let me just see, let me check time. How am I doing on time leaving here? I got till 3.10, excellent. We got about, okay, great, 25 minutes. So content security policy is a W3C standard. Content security policy 2.0 is just reaching stable status now. There are two major defenses we're going to talk about. We can move all inline script um, and remove all script that's embedded in our page and put them in separate JS files and, and then limit the browser's ability to execute inline JavaScript. This is the main defense that's built into content security policy. Let me say that one more time. First of all, we can take all of our JavaScript and put it into separate JS files. Isn't this something that we do already, or at least have been told to do already? This is good for performance and other, and other, other reasons. 
Now, um, once we've done that, we can enable content security policy, uh, default source is self or similar, and that will stop the ability of any inline JavaScript from executing. So next, um, we can use the nonce hash feature where we can set up an integrity hash or an integrity nonce to our embedded scripts. So I'll, we'll look at both of these in just a few minutes. So again, we have these two methods. Let's just, let's just get to it. So when should you apply CSP? When should you use content security policy? This is a great idea when you're starting a new web app from scratch. So you know, from day one, get your initial content security policy headers working. And then if anything goes wrong, you're, you're going to detect it early in the development life cycle and life, life is good. You want to apply CSP to every single endpoint in your application that delivers HTML. And it's often incredibly non-trivial to implement CSP in an existing complicated application. So we really want to start from the beginning. Let's look at some basic policies and content security policy. Again, these are response headers. When you're delivering a response header from the server to the browser, you enable this response header to tell the browser to turn on content security policy. The first thing we, this is the most basic strict policy where I say default source is self and object source is none. This eliminates all XSS. It shuts down flash. It stops mixed content and, it, and third party contents no longer allowed. No plugins. We will not load JavaScript from third party pages. No inline JavaScript can run. And you have to have all of your JavaScript in separate JS files for this to work properly. It's very strict, but very secure. When I'm building like simple websites, this is relatively easy to enable. But here's a more realistic policy for, a, for a, a more of a major provider, where I'm saying default source is self. Only JavaScript in separate JS files in my domain are allowed to run. Next, I'm allowed to load images from my content delivery network, like Akamai or similar. Object source is none, says no plugins are allowed to run on this page. Script source says, I am allowed to load JavaScript from my content delivery network, and I can load style from my content delivery network. This is realistic. It lets me do content security policy at web scale for a major application without, without you know, by, by still shutting down cross-site scripting very, very uh, in depth. Here's a more common policy, unfortunately. We say default source is self. The image source, we load images from a content delivery network. And we're going we're to allow inline JavaScript unsafely. This does not eliminate cross-site scripting or flash problems. It only shuts down third-party content and plugins from running. This is not a really good idea, even though it's common. This is a useless policy, where I'm saying default source is anywhere. Script source is anywhere. Unsafe inline and unsafe eval are allowed. So we're basically saying we'll accept anything, and it doesn't actually provide any security at all. Here's a crazy policy. This is Twitter's policy. Let's just move on. Okay. So seriously, let's, let's start over. What is content security policy? It's a response header, a set of directives. It's going to determine what the browser is allowed to do. This is my greatest hope for a more secure web. The web is pretty bad right now. So when we have a new generation of developers building applications from scratch using content security policy, we have a really big hope for much more robust and secure applications. So, so how do we do this? We want to limit where resources can load from. So I had a, I had a designer build a website for me. And he's just a designer. And so all the JavaScript came from Google. All the CSS was on his domain. And uh, it was just, I had to go and clean it up a little bit. So he's loading content from like 10 different locations doing absolutely crazy things. Great designer, bad at security. So, you got to really heavily limit where resources are allowed to load from. And if you're building something like CN, a news article, and you're doing mashups between 10 different domains, there's no hope for you. Okay. Number one, we want to, two, in, disable um, the use of eval. We want to disable inline JavaScript, disable inline CSS. So what do we mean by inline JavaScript? I mean things like this, right? You know, what, what is all of this? This is evil. This is bad development practice. This is when you're embedding your event handlers or similar directly into the page. Let's have a moment of security confessions. 
Security Confessions is a time for redemption and healing. Are you ready to play? Do you still do inline JavaScript in your applications at all? Who does? Raise your hand. I do a little bit. So, bad. Stop doing that. There's, is there any good excuse to do that today? Fast. Remember, this is, it's fast to code, but it's not, any, it's not any faster from a performance point of view. From a from a performance point of view, you're way better off putting it into a separate JS file and caching it. I, I believe there's no good excuse to do inline JavaScript anymore. That's just my take on it. And don't worry, I'm going to give a chance for everyone to win here. Just bear with me. So one step is to make sure we never do this. How does a browser know which one of these scripts is safe and which one of these scripts comes from an evil attacker? Does a browser have any clue? No way. Yes, Ken. No, the top one is good because it says good. <laughs> Other than that, does the browser know it's good though? Absolutely not. So that, that's the problem. Or how about this? Does a browser know what's good and what's bad? Absolutely not. It doesn't matter how this content got into the page, the browser is going to execute it. So <coughs> CSP, we got built in reporting. We have report only mode for testing. You can set a report only and enforced header for the same page. You can both do enforcement and reporting. Let's see it again here. So I'm a little bit, make a plan. Yeah, let's go one more step back here. So we want to apply CSP in all environments, dev, staging, and prod. Use your co-employees as beta testers. Have a safety valve. When you first release Content Security Policy Live, get ready to pull it back fast. Because when you first work with this, things tend to break. It is a complex mechanism. We want to ensure, like we said, make sure no inline script is introduced. Make sure no hosts are introduced. Set realistic expectations and goals. This is difficult stuff to get right for a complex application. So one of the first things I like to do is use some kind of client-side tool to test my policy. It's a different policy for page off, per page often. These are different browser plugins that will let me drop in a content security policy um, into the browser and apply it to the current page. This lets me test to make sure my policy is working properly or not, right? So how do you get, you gotta write code. You gotta provide a library. Here's an example of what I mean by, by, you know, first of all, don't make developers concat strings to do policy. Trust me on this. You can use CSP as developers. Uh, make sure you have some kind of library so they are programmatically configuring policy not just writing a huge chunk of string like this, right? But, but even this is reasonable if this is accurate because we can say it's still a configurable policy. It's still a, a lot, could be put into a library that developers call and not have to uh, you know, manually write this policy themselves. This is if it's available in enforce mode, we'll say the response header is content security policy. If we're not in enforce mode, we'll say content security policy report only policy. And when we say report only, we can provide a URL so when things break, the browser will send a message back to our server to let us know what went wrong without hurting the user's experience. There are tons of good libraries out there that let you build content security policy programmatically as opposed to string building. And uh, I use the secure header project for my Go stuff or, head or high lines for Java. Very reasonable libraries. So do you really need a library to do content security policy? Yes, you do. Let's move on. So content security policy level two, it's your best friend. It has some great superpowers built into it. So over at Twitter, for two years, they tried to remove inline script. But because of you and you and you, it, it <laughs> failed. For, for, the, the developer was like, yeah, but it's, 20 microseconds faster for event handling if I do it in line, whatever. So I agree, especially for big applications, it is really hard to remove JavaScript from the body. But then we use script noncing, and in two weeks we, we pushed it live. Two weeks it was pushed live. This is a, a story from a Twitter engineer, not my own. So let's look at this. 
When you use the content security policy nonce capability, you have, here's a response header, X content security policy, script source, nonce, ABC123, there's the nonce value. Now I have script with the nonce, ABC123, I can run. And the script with no nonce, this will never happen. Now you can, even when you're doing dirty things like inline JavaScript, you can tell the browser that this script block is acceptable because of your noncing. Now this nonce value should be random and different per page. The attacker should not be able to predict it in any way. Not only can you do script noncing, you can also do script hashing. This is just the, this would be the uh, SHA-256 value of, of the particular script they want to accept. I don't like this, I like noncing better, just my, my personal feeling, right? And other thing is you want to build CSP into your framework. So in order to enable it in your framework, you have, a, you have yeah, some kind of configuration option, make it easy or built in as much as possible, especially when starting new, new applications. Mm -mm. Yeah, Neil is a big fan of the hashing. So we, he, has, he has a chunk of, he has a function that grabs the, the current HTML he's trying to hash. He has the, you know, Crypto.js, has the SHA-1 of that, and then builds the proper SHA-1 hash dynamically. This does work, it's a good idea um, and worth considering. So you're not gonna be successful at CSP on a large scale if you don't analyze your reports. So when you're doing content security policy, here's an example of a report that's being sent back uh, to the browser. CSP report, here's the document URI that broke for some way, here's the refer of where they came from, here's the blocked URI, this image tag, because it violated image source itself. This page was trying to load an image from a different domain, but example.org specified that images were only allowed to load from their domain, so this got rejected, and this is a report sent back to your domain so you can understand what went wrong or what, what broke. So, what's not, so since you have a library, you can add this report URI directly into your, into your library very easily. Most libraries support this already, actually. So the block URI, that's the host that is, is getting d disabled in some way. The document URI, um, yeah, that's the full path to where the, where the problem happened. The violated directive, that's the, the actual CSP policy that was violated, and things like the user agent and browser tell you what kind of browser this, this executed on. Good. Drop that, drop that. And so here, the other good thing is to monitor this in a live way. This is, this is awesomeness. So here we're showing all these different content security policy reports and different issues being charted in real time. This, let, this gives us an idea if we did something really wrong, gives, especially at web scale. It gives us an idea that we pushed something live that we shouldn't have had to. This is as opposed to just analyzing manual reports one at a time. We can just put those into a data tracking system and look at these in a more... Uh, more graphical way, so we can see spikes and anomalies in an easier way. Yep, alert on spikes of activity. If we suddenly start seeing a large number of CSP failures in a certain page, either we're being attacked or something, or the user is being attacked, or something really wrong is going on here. So what else do we have here? Okay, make sure only compliant code is introduced. That's why you start from day one. Provide the tools to configure a policy, a good library. Monitor, monitor reports, build a case to really push this live for everybody. Test on your employees, beta testers. Gradually turn the dial up from zero to 11 to fully enable it across all of your sites and profit from a secure application. And a couple issues that, that still make CSP a bit of a challenge. You know, inline reports are difficult to decipher. A lot of these reports are difficult to decipher. And these inline violations, they look just ugly and hard to interpret properly. Script, sample, yep, I'm gonna call it a day. I'm still, I got 10 minutes. So any, before I move on, any questions about anything we talked about? What did we talk, we talked about, from a defensive point of view, we briefly talked about treat your, your, your clients like a thin client. Keep business logic and highly sensitive data out of your JavaScript APIs, number one. 
We then talked about for basic templating systems to use contextual output escaping. Whenever you're putting a string to the user interface, escape it in one of five or more contexts to, to, without changing the data, just convert them to an inert form that will not execute. We then talked about HTML sanitization. When we have HTML coming from an untrusted source, we, uh, when we have HTML entering our software, we can't encode because it won't render, so we have to do proper HTML sanitization for those endpoints. And then when we, we start using JavaScript, just use the safe JavaScript APIs, and then content security policy. That's the be all, end all. If you're starting a new project, do content security policy from day one, the defensive benefits will be dramatic. And you know, not every, not every, uh, not every browser supports CSP, i.e. as a laggard. This is not gonna give you perfect security, but it's gonna, it's gonna give you more and more security over time as the browsers support this more and more. The two big supporters are gonna be Chrome and Firefox have actually really good support now. Like everything else on the web, IE is behind the, behind the times and promise to support it in the very near future, especially when, when, uh, when Spartan comes out and so on. So that's what we talked about today. Any questions, please? So are, are you, so seeing, uh, any issue with older browsers? I mean, in, in most of the real world? No, not browsers? an issue, it just won't, CSP just won't work. Right, so is, is anybody tracking like the percentage of sites that this is still a problem? Like if you go to CSP, you still have to do the other stuff to protect yourself? Oh, you, wait, hang on. Regardless of you using CSP or not, do all the other stuff. Yeah. So that, that, that's, that's the real answer, unfortunately. Let's still, you know, let, we need that for functionality as well as security. Let's still do our encoding everywhere, our HTML sanitization everywhere. We still need all of that. CSP is an additional layer, not one that we can use instead of everything else. So it's a, it's a defense in depth layer. Exactly. And, and, and these are, see, defense in depth is a weird term. I often see people saying, yeah, let's take 10 weak layers, now we have a strong layer. That doesn't work. We've got to have 10 strong layers, you know, like ES, ESAPI armor, you know, body armor. It's like multiple plates built in, you know, to stop. Anyways, let me, let me not go there right now, but uh, CSP is an ultra strong layer in browsers that support it. Today, you'll get good Firefox and Chrome support, and in a year or two, your apps will suddenly pick up IE support. So yeah, use it, but not by itself. Yes, sir? Some frameworks also break CSP, either for example, Angular. Angular does. Breaks? Because Angular sucks. They use eval, they use eval all over the place and inline script everywhere. This is written by a bunch of crazy monkeys. I don't know what they were thinking. And, so, and, they, and yet a lot of us are using Angular, but it was, it was, it was built in such a half-assed way that I, I, I struggle to even want to use it. Now, but, but again, what you do have in, 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 in Angular is automatic escaping, which is pretty decent. But, you're, but what people do in Angular every day, they turn off escaping for some crazy reason and they're accessible. So you gotta use it, it's just a tool. You gotta use it right. But Angular and the way it was built, it's like crazy monkeys read it. It's like, I don't know what they were thinking. Inline script everywhere. Like every bad practice for JavaScript design is in Angular, all of them. Oh well. Yes, sir. How about like what? Never even heard of it, I'm sorry. Take it all, I'll look it up. If you email me um, offline, I'll, I'll look it up and see what I can come up with. Question in the back? That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, there is, an, there is an enablement for CSP, but... Yeah, here, I'm looking at it on page right now. I, I've looked at about two dozen Angular applications, zero of them use this. And it shuts down, it shuts down a bunch of functionality. It's a different fork of Angular, I believe. No, it doesn't shut down anything. So... so actually, once you use Angular for Chrome extensions and Chrome applications, and they require you to use CSP as well. Why, why does nobody use this then? Why, I haven't seen it in any web apps to date yet. 
Oh. Yeah, up here. Slower, <laughs> it throws a bunch of errors. Well, there you go. There's your answer. Yeah. Use, the, use NGCSP and you're all set. Any other questions? I have you for about five more minutes. Let me just show you a couple things for fun. Well, oh. hello. I'm going to use these five minutes to show you one, one quick thing. Let's, let's end with some, let's do some fun at the end here. You know, OSX machines are, all, are overall very unhappy machines. So how do you make an OSX machine a much happier machine? Run a, v, run a Windows VM on it. Just kidding, Ken. Give me one sec here. The, uh, that we, we've been saying that for a long time, but the world went in the opposite direction. Everything is JavaScript now. So, but luckily, I mean, the strategy to really stop injection, I hope it's, it's not that bad. Escape and use safe APIs. So the way developers use JavaScript now, they use everything. And I'm actually trying to say, hey, look, you don't need to do all of that to populate the DOM safely. Just use these three APIs and you're mostly good to go. So it's, it's just a matter of awareness. The, you know, the, the, the one factor that determines if your app will be secure, it's not the framework, it's not the language, it's the developer. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a developer educator. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, un, I'm very biased when I say this. You have to educate your developers about security to have any hope of secure software development. And you know what I, I'm going to sleep now, I think, all right. Let me see if I can, I still have just a few minutes. Let me see if I can pull this off. Does this bother you to see this? It's not even here. All right. All right. I'm up here writing Eclipse and WebGo. I'm just going to show you a few quick things for fun. Go localhost. Proxies refusing connections. So let's run the proxy. Zap. There he goes up. To show you, I got two minutes. I'm not gonna be able to do that much, but we'll do it anyways. All right, go away proxy, XSS, stored. Let's go look at my attack kit. Anybody here a fan of uh, of football? What we Americans call soccer. So one of the one of the attacks I always always is fun is to do what I call the. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. No, not that one. Yeah, let's, do, let's do this one first. This is, a, this is actually a stored phishing attack. Let's look at this. So in this, I'm going to say, you know, hello, admin, and drop this attack in. I'm going to submit. Oh, that's, that's me scanning the heck out of this. Wow, OK. The admin clicks on the link now, and the JavaScript executes. It just rewrites the login page in the site itself. The admin then re-logs in. Admins are frequently prompted to re-log in in a good application. There's my super advanced password. I log in, log in successful, back to the site. But let's look at what really happened here. I want to, I'm going to put my, I want to intercept. Come on, gently. I want to intercept. Uh, no, I'm going to swap this out. Hang on for a sec. Oh, 
want web scarab. I want to change my proxy real quick. And this is to show you how a proxy tool is run. I'm going to go to network settings 8008. There we go. Okay. Close. Okay. Let's refresh. Nope. So what different proxy? Boom. So I'm doing this on the fly quick. My apology. Network settings. 80, which one do I want? I want 808. I want this one. Use proxy 8008. There we go. Boom. Let's close that. Good to go. Try again. Yay, we're all working here. So let's go back to this stored XSS attack. Let's look at this. The admin logs in, but let's intercept get requests that leave the browser so we can see what goes on here. I log in, log in successful, and then right away we see that the browser is taking this admin password and dumping it out to a different domain. I mean, the damage we can do with cross-site scripting is off the chart. Leave in, leave in. Shh. Guys, please, please don't. Just, uh, just let me finish this up, then we can, then we can chit-chat. Um, so let's look at this attack code real quick. What went down here? So this attack code is just a simple chunk of style. Function, do the crazy, document element ID, password. This is the function that scrapes the password puts it into an image tag to exfiltrate it to a different site. What's the issue here? How does this work? An image tag has no origin policy. We can use an image tag to exfiltrate any data do a JavaScript injection attack. We're not actually rendering the image here. All that we're doing is, is we're just using it to exfiltrate data because an image tag will automatically make a get request. I got, I'm, I'm done. I, do I have one, one minute or call it or? Done? I'm done. Um, <laughs> more demos. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I hope this helped you in some way. Thank you for showing up and uh, have a great day. Cheers, everyone.